This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Um, my handout um, is in the um, folder of stuff you got yesterday. <coughs> Um, well, this paper was prompted by reviewing an excellent recent book on Milton and Ovid by Mandy Green, uh, Milton's Ovidian Eve of 2009. Uh, Green takes a single Miltonic character and explores the superimposition onto Eve of a series of characters in Ovid's Metamorphoses and Fasti. Narcissus, Pygmalion statue, Daphne, Flora, Proserpina, Ceres, Venus, Pomona, Pyrrha. And the many faces of Eve, many Ovidian faces of Eve, as Green puts it, allow Milton to explore a range of roles and subject positions that Eve's daughters will be called upon to play in human society, with a particular focus on the relationships between the sexes and on sexual politics. An attention to Ovidian intertextuality also interacts with modern concerns in the interpretation of Eve, whether her marriage to Adam is companionate or patriarchal, whether she is Adam's equal or inferior, whether from the moment of her creation she is trapped in the role of temptress to be. And Green speaks of the Co a quote, comprehensive shifting balance of opposing forces <coughs> that is fundamental to Milton's conception of his Eve. The range of Ovidian roles played by Eve also traces a development from birth through pre-sexual innocence to sexual experience and marriage, and finally to death with the possibility of rebirth and regeneration. Thus, within the short time span of the primary narrative of Paradise Lost, uh, we start with Eve's um, birth of the peculiar kind experienced by Pygmalion's statue, that is, awakening into a fully adult capacity for knowledge of self and of others. Eve rapidly comes to self-awareness through what can be thought of as a Lacanian mirror stage that replicates the experience of Ovid's Narcissus <coughs> before swerving from it into relationships with others, firstly with God, whose voice warns against self-love and leads her to another individual of whom she is nevertheless a likeness, Adam. She is brought to Adam as a coy nymph, inclined like Daphne to flee, but quickly turns from being a nymph like Diana Double to being a complacent rape victim like Ovid's Chloris in Fasti V, or somewhat differently, Pomona, pursued by the Tumnus in Metamorphosis 14. And she then becomes a devoted wife, again a Pomona, or a youthful version of Baucis to Adam's Philemon. This is a happy marriage, which, like that of Caix and Alcyone in Metamorphoses 11, is broken off by death, in this case the spiritual death of the fall, an event which is also the introduction into the world of mankind's literal mortality. When she eats the apple, Eve repeats Proserpina's self-condemnation to a continued existence in Hades through the plucking and eating of the pomegranate. But this is a death, figurative death, that is followed by regeneration, as Adam and Eve's repentance is met by prevenient grace, and our general ancestors now take on the roles of Deucalion and Pyrrha, surviving after the shipwreck of the prelapsarian world, and resolved to populate the world after the catastrophe. This is a prefiguration both of the repopulation of the world after the biblical flood and of the final redemption of mankind through Christ into eternal life. Now, for the most part, Green sees Milton as combining what in Ovid are unconnected stories. For example, this is the first quote on the handout. Um, she says, by yoking discrete episodes, Narcissus and Apollo and Daphne, uh, from Ovidian myth into fruitful collaboration, Milton stirs the dry bones of Genesis to strangely independent life and meaning, offering complex emotional insights and the differing trajectories of erotic desire in the first man and woman. And Green's analysis of Milton's practice in combining different Ovidian characters within the single person of Eve is anticipated by Richard du Rocher in his 1985 book on Milton and Ovid. Um, 
uh, where he talks again, quote, on the handout of recombining scattered mythic figures from the metamorphoses in order to highlight distinct stages in Eve's development. <coughs> what I want to do is to suggest that Milton's combinatorial imitation of a variety of the Vigian characters in the construction of Eve's character reveals a Renaissance reader of Ovid alert to the kind of intratextualities that modern readers of Ovid multiply in the metamorphoses. <coughs> Combinatorial imitation is a term that I used many years ago in discussion of the imitation of Virgil's Aeneid by later Roman epic poets, Ovid and the Flavian epicists, Valerius Flaccus, Statius and Silius Italicus. And I use the term to refer to the imitation within a single passage of the alluding author of two, or sometimes more than two, separate passages in the Aeneid. In many cases, passages which modern critics of Virgil read as being in significant relationships within the Aeneid itself. And this is in line with, I think, the now prevalent, prevailing view that the Aeneid is not only a vast echo chamber of a host of earlier Greek and Latin texts, but also, as it were, an internal self-alluding echo chamber. That Ovid's Metamorphoses is also this kind of poem is but one of the ways in which the Metamorphoses attempts to meet the challenge laid down by Virgil to subsequent Latin authors of long hexameter narrative poems. And combinatorial imitation can be a way of thinking about how other Renaissance authors respond to their models, classical or otherwise. For example, Shakespeare's intricate weaving together in The Winter's Tale of a number of stories from the Metamorphoses, producing what A.D. Nuttall referred to as, quote, a complex sequence of unrivaled power. Not all implies that it is Shakespeare's own poetic powers that fuse together a disparate range of Ovidian stories into something greater than the sum of the parts. I would want to suggest that Shakespeare is responding to complex relationships that are already operative within the Metamorphoses, at least for a particular kind of reader of Ovid. And that kind of reader, I would venture to say, is now the standard kind of reader, at least within my own profession of classical Latinist. My approach is also an intervention in an ongoing discussion among students of Renaissance literature as to the ways in which early modern readers read their classical texts and the implications therefrom for the practice of imitation and illusion. It has been argued that an emphasis on reading, uh, on extracting exemplar from texts and the practice of compiling commonplace books fostered a reading in parts rather than as a whole and the consequent atomization and fragmentation of texts will then be reflected in localized and particularist practices of imitation. <coughs> this is an attempt to delimit imitative practice by reference to what Colin Burrow in a forthcoming book on literary imitation labels historical intertextualism, i.e. a focus on an author's position within contemporary practices and uh, discussions relating to imitation. <coughs> Such historical contextualization is always salutary, but it should not be used to close down possibilities for ways of reading and imitating, even on the parts of readers and authors of average education and ability let alone authors, is impossible to confine within narrow expectations as a Shakespeare or a Milton. And Raphael Lyne, um, in his book on <coughs> uh, uh, translations of uh, the Metamorphoses, has offered some persuasive correctives to the reading in parts rather than as a whole approach to Renaissance imitative practice. And Maggie Kilgore, in her recent book on Milton and Ovid, gives examples of the combination of similar Ovidian characters within a range of Renaissance texts, going back to the work that Maggie uh, identifies as the first in what she calls the deluge of Ovidian writings in the 16th century, T.H.'s 1560, The Fable of Ovid, Treating of Narcissus, in which a parallel is drawn between the stories of Narcissus and Marcias. An awareness of the relationships between different stories in the Metamorphoses is also central to Paul Borowski's discussion of the importance of Ovidianism in Renaissance <coughs> art, <coughs> art and literature. What uh, Borowski calls, quote, the ancient poet's capacity to metamorphose one myth into another. <coughs> 
as for example the transformation, Borowski's term, of the story of Narcissus into that of Pygmalion. Borowski's claim that the notion of poetic transformation is determinative for the Renaissance. For example, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici's poem The Ambra runs together the Ovidian stories of Apollo and Daphne, Arethusa and Deucalion and Pyrrha. And this principle of transformation operates, according to Borowski, at the levels of both form and subject matter. So the figure of Apollo in Bernini's statue group of Apollo and Daphne is a metamorphosis of the formal level of the Apollo Belvedere, and in turn Poussin's painting of Pan's pursuit of Syrinx is a transform of Bernini's Apollo and Daphne. And of course the thwarted rapes of Daphne and Syrinx constitute a narrative doublet within Book I of the Metamorphoses. What I want to do um, is first to look at a range of examples of Milton's combinatorial imitation of Ovidian characters in the person of Eve. And secondly, I will go on to explore the link between the relationship of similarity that links different episodes in the Metamorphoses and which is reflected in Milton's combinatorial imitation of those episodes, the link between that uh, on the one hand and on the other Milton's thematization of likeness, reflection and doubling. So, uh, <coughs> Ovidian intertextualities. Um, the first um, passage on the handout is, is the whole of um, Eve's narcissistic experience when she first comes to life. And I'll be looking at various bits of it at different points. So I start with a small example. <coughs> Uh, Mandy Green sees in Eve's report of Adam's words to Eve when she first catches sight of him, uh, this is um, PL4481 and following at the bottom of the page there, um, allusion to the Ovidian Apollo's words to the flying Daphne. Thou following criedst aloud, return, fair Eve, whom fliest thou? Whom thou fliest, of him thou art, his flesh, his bone. Um, and I've given you um, the passage from Met 1 um, under number 2 on the handout, lines 514. Uh, Apollo to Daphne, Nescis, Temerarian Nescis, Quem Fugias, Idioque Fugis. <coughs> Green notes the echo in the double, doubled flyest and the Milton of the repetition fugias fugis in uh, the Ovid. Green also thinks that the repetition of Nescis <coughs> may have suggested to Milton a thematic motif peculiar to Narcissus, Daphne and Eve, their lack of essential knowledge. But in a footnote, Green rejects Kenneth Knuspel's claim that Adam's words allude to Narcissus's address to his reflection, Metamorphosis 3, 476 and following, uh, also under number 2, Quo refugis, whither do you fly? Uh, and Green rejects the allusion here on the grounds that quote, Adam's words more closely resemble Apollo's. Well, that may be true, but I would prefer to keep both Ovidian intertexts in play and point to the intratextuality, whereby the Ovidian-Apollo's relationship with Daphne is already highly narcissistic. Apollo's rebuke to the fleeing Daphne that she does not know whom she flees implies that Apollo himself has fully realised the Delphic precept of know thyself. <coughs> Apollo follows this up with an attempt at erotic persuasion in the form of a list of his own powers that in effect constitutes a hymn to Apollo, but as a hymn to himself, a thoroughly narcissistic performance. Apollo's response to Daphne's final escape from his erotic attentions through metamorphosis into a tree is to appropriate the foliage of the tree to himself so that the laurel becomes an attribute and identifying mark of his own person. Apollo takes the apparent nodding of the laurel tree after he has finished speaking as a sign of the quondam girl's agreement to this perpetual connection with the god in the future. <coughs> But readers of Callimachus's hymn to Apollo, which begins with the shaking laurel as the sign of the epiphany of the god, may understand that the laurel's nod signifies the presence only of Apollo, and not the continuing presence as a conscious person of the metamorphosed Daphne. Adam's question to Eve, whom fliest thou, follows immediately after Eve's narcissistic experience of her own reflection in the pool. Adam persuades Eve to return by emphasising that she is a part of himself. 
486 and following, an individual solace, dear, part of my soul, I seek thee. Degrees of resemblance is what it is all about. Adam's relationship to Eve is what one might call a legitimate narcissism, a proper desire of like for like, but not too like. If you are prepared to accept that Milton alludes to both Apollos and Narcissus's question to their objects of desire as to why they are running away, and if you furthermore accept that the two questions point to wider connections between Apollo and Narcissus within the Metamorphoses, then I ask you to entertain the possibility that Ovid's intratextuality is intertextual with a Virgilian intratextuality in the use of questions using the second person singular, Fugis, you flee. This is now number three on the handout. The first occurrence is in Dido's first speech of complaint to Aeneas in book four, when she asks bitterly, Mene fugis, is it me that you're fleeing? Those words are echoed ironically and by a kind of poetic justice in the underworld, <coughs> book six, when in a scene that contains multiple inversions of the earlier dealings between Dido and Aeneas, Aeneas asks of the stonily unresponsive shade of Dido, 6466, quem fugis. The exact form of Aeneas's question, quem fugis, rather than mene fugis, however, replicates Aeneas's use of those words in the previous book, 5, to address the fleeting dream vision of his dead father, Anchises. <coughs> Quem fugis, out quiste nostris complexibus arquet. The fact that Aeneas, whose goal in travelling to the underworld is to be reunited with the shade of his father, uses the very same words to the shade of Dido, is perhaps a further indication of the depth of his attachment to Dido. A route to a closer connection between Virgil's Dido and Aeneas, and Ovid's Daphne and Apollo, might be traced through the image of the Diana lookalike. Daphne is described um, as the rival <coughs> um, of unwed uh, Diana, and this is the appearance under which Dido first presents herself to the eyes of Aeneas in the famous simile comparing uh, Dido to Diana um, when uh, Aeneas first sees her after he's been looking at the scenes in the Temple of Juno. Milton practices his own further intratextuality with the motif of flight in an erotic context in the perverted foreshadowing of the generation of Eve from the body of Adam and the ensuing drama of narcissism corrected in the account of the self-generation by Satan of sin who springs from Satan's own head followed by the incestuous uh, and narcissistic coupling of Satan and sin the issue of which is death Death, who immediately commits um, incestuous rape on his own mother. Um, <clears throat> this is now number four on the handout. Sin recounts her rape experience to Satan thus, uh, book 2787 seven and following, I fled and cried out death. Hell trembled at the hideous name and sighed from all her caves, and back resounded death. I fled, but he pursued. Here there is a chiastic doubling of I fled and death, with which may be compared the chiastic doubling in Adam's appeal to Eve in Book 4 of Whom fliest thou, whom thou fliest, etc. The doubling of death is here the doubling of echo in Ovidian terms, uh, given the coupling of the stories of echo and Narcissus in Metamorphoses 3, occurring in Milton appropriately enough in a family history that has already included a repetition of the self-love of Narcissus. A few lines before, Sin has reminded um, Satan, book 2, 7, 6, 4 and following, thyself in me thy perfect image viewing becamest enamoured. The reference to echo also functions at a textual level. The foul relationship between Satan, sin and death will be echoed in a fairer version in the first stages of the history of Adam and Eve. And Milton also echoes the doublings of the verb fugio in the Ovidian models and in Ovid's own Virgilian models. Death's pursuit and rape of sin is the first rape narrative in Paradise Lost indeed the first in universal history, as Apollo and Daphne is the first in the series of rape narratives in the Metamorphoses and in Ovid's own cosmic history.
I return to Adam and Eve and look now at the Miltonic combination of Ovid's Narcissus with another Ovidian character. Eve's reluctance to be united with Adam results from her lingering attachment to an illegitimate and sterile form of narcissism. I'll firstly look at some of the further narcissist aspects of Eve. This is back to the, the long passage on the first side of the handout. Eve goes to the lake as she wanders, lines 451 and following, where and what I was, whence thither brought and how. Tiresias in Metamorphoses 3 prophesies that Narcissus will have a long life if he does not know himself. See, say, no, no were it. On first awakening, Eve experiences the delusion of Ovid's Narcissus when she falls in love with her own reflection in the lake. But the voice of God ensures that Eve will undergo a happier drama of self-knowledge. <coughs> This is, of course, one of the longest and most complex of Milton's imitations of an Ovidian episode and the subject of a whole chapter in Maggie Kilgore's new book. <clears throat> for an account of what happened before she came to consciousness, we have to wait for Adam's narrative of the same sequence of events in Book 8, where <clears throat> the fashioning of Eve from the bone of Adam's rib echoes Pygmalion's sculpting of his ivory statue of a shape and beauty unknown in women brought into the world by natural birth. <coughs> um, and I've given you, uh, I hope, perhaps I haven't, um, yeah, number five on the handout, the <coughs> uh, Met 10, 248 and following, Formanque dedit qua femina nasci nulla potest. Uh, the example of Pygmalion is present in um, the creation of Eve in two ways. Eve, like Pygmalion's statue, is created by an unnatural birth, because of course natural childbirth would only become possible once the first woman has come into existence. Although after that, Eve, as the general mother, will become the model for the former, in the sense of shape rather than beauty, of all subsequent women who come to birth. And secondly, God works as a sculptor, eight, Paradise Lost 8, 4, 6, 9 and following, uh, still at number 5, the rib he formed and fashioned with his hands, under his forming hands a creature grew. The story of Pygmalion's statue offers itself readily as an analogue to the peculiar circumstances of Eve's coming to being. Reading it back into Eve's repetition of the experience of Narcissus in Book 4 also makes for an improvement on the Ovidian story of Narcissus, since unlike the 16-year-old Narcissus, it really is with unexperienced thought that Eve tries to make sense of what she sees in the mirror of the lake, just as Pygmalion's statue comes to consciousness as an adult woman with no previous experience of waking life. <coughs> As Patrick Hume notes in his 1695 commentary on Paradise Lost, Milton, quote, has made it much more probable that a person who had never seen anything like herself should be in love with her own faint reflected resemblance than that a man acquainted with the world and himself should be undone by so dull a dotage, close quotes. And there may indeed already be an allusion to the Pygmalion story in Eve's own account of her first moments. Uh, if you look at um, book four, lines 455 five and following, she comes to a, a liquid plain, pure as the expanse of heaven. I th thither went with unexperienced thought and laid me down on the green bank to look into the clear, smooth lake that to me seemed another sky. The first thing that Pygmalion's statue sees are her lover and the sky, Met 10, 2, 9, 3 and following, this is under number 6 on the handout, uh, timidum qua ad lumina lumen atolens pariter cum kylo vidit amantem. When Eve looks into the lake, she sees what she takes to be another sky, and immediately afterwards her own reflection, her own lover. <coughs> In the Ovidian lines on the <coughs> coming to consciousness of uh, Pygmalion's statue, there is also a connection with what Narcissus sees in his pool at uh, 3, line 420. This is the last item under number 6. Uh, lying on the ground, he gazed at those twin stars, his eyes, Geminum sua luminous sedus. 
Here, through the metaphorical equation of his own eyes with the stars, Kylum, Sky, and Anan's lover collapse into one. And this is just one of the many connections between the Narcissus and Pygmalion episodes within the Metamorphoses, connections that have frequently been noted by Ovidian critics. Um, and Giampiero Rosati's classic 1983 study, Narciso e Pygmalione, is in fact absent from Green's bibliography, although uh, normally she's pretty good on the classical stuff. In each case, an erotic attachment is formed to an object of desire too close to the lover, himself in the case of Narcissus, and his own creation in the case of Pygmalion, a statue formed to express his own conception of ideal female beauty. The latent incestuous narcissism in Pygmalion's love is manifested in the erotic attachments of his descendants, of firstly his great-granddaughter Mira to her father Kinaras, and secondly the attraction of Venus to his great-great-grandson Adonis, the spitting image of Venus's own son, Cupid. Uh, I think I'll skip over the next bit on Scylla. Uh, <coughs> Um, another example uh, of Milton's yoking of Ovidian narratives already in a significant relationship within the metamorphosis, um, uh, again, the first episode in Eve's relationship with Adam, which threatens to turn into the first in the sequence of Ovid's narratives of rape, the pursuit of Daphne by Apollo. Uh, we're now on to number eight on the handout. Some even see a hint of a forceful conquest of Eve at 4488 and following, with that thy gentle hand seized mine, I yielded. But the yielding Eve quickly falls, if there is a hint of rape here, Eve quickly falls into the role of a Pomona, happily clinging like a vine to her husband Elm, and joined by their shared love of gardening. This gains point if one reflects on the coherence within the metamorphoses of the whole series of rape narratives, as analysed in particular by Gregson Davis in his book The Death of Procris. The story of Apollo and Daphne is the first of a sequence of rapes which culminates in the story of Pomona and Vertumnus in Book 14. That story provides closure by inverting and negating the elements of the narrative pattern. Pomona is no huntress nymph of the wilds, but a cultivator of gardens. When Vertumnus, the god of transformations, finds that none of his disguises succeed in his aim of penetrating Pomona's body as well as her garden, he is on the point of using force to get his way. But when he appears in his true shape, force proves unnecessary, since Pomona experiences a mutual wound of love and freely yields to her lover. In Paradise, that is to say, the threat of rape, the Apollo and Daphne model, is instantly averted by the kicking in of the Vertumnus and Pomona model. Furthermore, an awareness of the Ovidian series of violent rapes or attempted rapes brought to a conclusion in erotic pursuit, overtaken by mutual love, makes more shocking the inversion or corruption of that pattern uh, when the fall is engineered by Satan in the guise of a malevolent Vertumnus who enters the garden in a changed form to seduce Eve verbally and figuratively and so to deflower her at the point when she herself plucks the fruit. The carefully cultivated Garden of Eden thus turns out to be as dangerous a place as the typical Ovidian Locus Amoinus in the uncultivated countryside where violence and rape are inevitable. In Paradise Lost, then, the Ovidian tales of Narcissus and Apollo and Daphne are replayed in comic mode, while the happy ever after story of Pomona and Vertumnus is replayed in tragic mode. Once Satan Vertumnus uh, has successfully penetrated Eve's defences, Adam and Eve again feel mutual desire, but now of the fallen variety, and the mutua vulnera, the mutual wounds of Vertumnus and Pomona, turn into mutual guilt. There they, their fill of love and love's disport, took largely of their mutual guilt, the seal. Um, I'll skip over... Uh, Salmachus and Hermaphroditus and come on to the second part. <coughs> uh, likenesses and doubles. 
Milton compares Eve to Pomona by name at the point when the hands that had first been joined when Eve had been persuaded not to flee like Naphne are parted for the last time before the fall. Pomona is one in a series of five mythological women to whom Eve is compared in a multiple simile, this is number 11 on the handout, um, which as Alistair Fowler notes ad lock is, quote, so discriminating that it consists largely of qualifications. Both the cast list, um, with exception of Pallies and qualifications, are heavily Ovidian. I'll just read through that uh, passage, thus saying, From her husband's hand, her hand soft she withdrew, and like a wood nymph flight, Oread or Dryad, or of Delia's train, but took her to the grove, groves, but Delia's self in gait surpassed, and goddess-like deport, though not as she with bow and quiver armed, but with such gardening tools as art yet rude, guiltless of fire had formed, or angels brought. To Pallines or Pomona thus adorned, likeliest she seemed, Pomona when she fled Vertumnus, or to Ceres in her prime, yet virgin of Proserpina from Jove. The effect is to linger on the unfallen and, in a sense, still virginal beauty of Eve just before the fall. The lingering is also that of Adam's gaze, as we realise when we read on to find that he is still looking after her departing form. Uh, lines 397 and following, her long with ardent look his eye pursued, delighted, but desiring more her stay. The multiplicity of comparands asks the reader to reflect on degrees of likeness between Eve and her classical avatars. Like, surpassed, goddess-like, though not as she, likeliest, and at the same time to think about similarities between the classical females. This is a passage all about comparing and contrasting. The difference between the visual lingering of Adam and that of the reader is that Adam has no other woman with which to compare Eve. The accumulation of illusions which build up a composite picture for the reader reminds us of the impossibility of ever recapturing Adam's vision of a truly incomparable Eve, <coughs> or at least comparable only to himself. Um, the absence of other women with which to compare her makes of that likeness to her male original something unique. And these similarities are largely Ovidian approximations. Milton's multiple simile begins with the comparison of Eve to a nymph, and more specifically a nymph of Delia's, i.e. Diana's train. Daphne, the first in the series of nymph rape victims in the Metamorphoses, is introduced by Ovid as um, number 12 on the handout, Met 1476, uh, in Luptae the right unwed Diana. And that's also the first in a series of Diana lookalikes in the Met. Milton also has in mind the famous simile in Aeneid 1, when Dido, as Aeneas first catches sight of her, is compared to Diana. And that simile, as is well known, is modelled on the simile in Odyssey 6, comparing Nausicaa to Artemis. Um, and the Virgilian simile, in turn, is a model for Ovid's comparison of Philomela to a nymph in Metamorphoses 6. The Homeric and Virgilian Artemis, or Diana, is distinguished from her company of nymphs in other respects similar to herself by her superior height. Eve's distinction is that she is like a nymph who surpasses her goddess in gait and deport rather than height. So Milton's simile is like but swerves from its Homeric and Virgilian models. Lines 390 to 2 Though not as she with bow and quiver armed, but with such gardening tools as art yet rude, guiltless of fire had formed or angels brought. Those lines prepare us for the explicit mention of Pomona in line 393, through allusion to uh, Ovid's um, description of Pomona in Metamorphoses 14, number 13 on the handout. No other nymph was keener in the care of orchard trees. Thence came her name. For in her heart she loved not woods nor rivers, but a plot of ground and boughs of smiling apples all around. She had no spear, only a pruning knife. Known Silvar Silanek Amne's neck, Yakolo, 
correct the reader's initial inclination to line up Pomona with the other nymphs whose lifestyle and fate have become so familiar to us in the preceding books. She is an anti-nymph. There is a telling divergence from the Ovidian model in Milton's reference to Pomona. To Pallies or Pomona thus adorned, likeliest she seemed, Pomona when she fled Vertumnus. Of course, in Ovid, Pomona does not flee from Vertumnus. However, our memory of all the other nymphs in the Metamorphoses in the series that culminates with Pomona might lead us to expect that this too would be a narrative of attempted rape and flight. Now, Milton folds the contrast between the activities of Pomona and of other nymphs into another Ovidian intertext, or rather class of intertext. By presenting the contrast between Eve's gardening tools and the bow and quiver of Diana as a kind of appendix to a simile, Milton makes of it an example of what I have labelled an approximative simile. That is to say, a simile of a typically Ovidian kind that makes a point of judging the exact degree of approximation of tenor to vehicle. The closest Ovidian parallels for the present passage are number 14 on the handout, first to the simile used of Philomela when Tyrius first catches sight of her, uh, and she's like a nymph, naiads and dryads, um, as we are used to hear, walking the woodland ways. Could one but give the nymphs such finery, such elegance? So in that respect, she is not like uh, a nymph. And secondly, the description of Syrinx uh, in Metamorphoses 1, <coughs> um, uh, easy to mistake Syrinx with Diana herself, were not her bow of horn Diana's gold. Even so, she was mistaken for Diana. Uh, I've argued that in Ovid, these approximative similes with their careful calibration of likeness and unlikeness and their concern to preserve discriminations are related to an Ovidian obsession with doubles and incest, operative at the levels both of theme and of the poet's anxiety about his relationship to his own work and an his anxiety about the relationship between art and nature, representation and reality. Furthermore, the tendency for stories with similar themes to merge into one another and the consequent pressure on the poet to maintain distinctions between them are phenomena related to the approximative simile. Ovid draws attention to this affinity in the first two narratives of this kind in the Metamorphoses, the stories of Daphne and Syrinx, so close in characters and story pattern that the narrator concludes the latter, the Syrinx story, in brief summary fashion in order to avoid sending the reader to sleep with boredom as the internal audience, Argos, is sent to sleep by the internal narrator, Mercury. Not coincidentally, Mercury starts off his tale of Syrinx with the first in the series of approximative similes in the poem. Or, to be more precise, this is the Syrinx passage under number 14, what is formally an approximation to an approximative simile, um, since it isn't actually in the form of a simile. I want to make the claim that in Paradise Lost, this interest in likeness between different stories and Milton's alertness to the Ovidian patterning of similarity and difference in the metamorphoses should not be restricted to the narratological level, but are connected to and reflect a central theological and anthropological theme, that of the correct relationship between original and model, with consequences for the proper regulation of interpersonal relationships. Paradise Lost is an epic about relationships, the relationship between the persons of the di divinity, between God and man, and between human beings, man and wife, parent and child, which includes the relationship between Adam, Adam and Eve and us, and the comparability of ourselves to our general ancestors, uh, the fairest of her daughters, Eve, like Diana, superior to her look-alike nymphs. At the intertextual level, Paradise Lost is in the business of judging too, and asking the reader to judge uh, its relationship to its own literary models, not the least important of which is of its metamorphoses. Um, now, num num number 15, um, I've given you some of the important likenesses in uh, Paradise Lost. Um, and the relationship between the father and the son is the model for an ideal resemblance of likeness to original. The relationships into which Satan enters 
both with himself and with his own progeny, sin and death, are parodic and perverted images both of the perfect relationships within the Trinity and of the perfectable relationships of human beings. Um, <coughs> I think I'll skip a little bit in the interest of time. <coughs> Um, it is immediately after her creation that Eve is called upon to exercise proper discrimination in the matter of her relationships with the only two human beings in existence in the world, i.e. herself and Adam. Deluded like Narcissus by the sight of her own reflection, it is through things heard, the voice of God, that she is instructed in the need to turn towards another person to whom she stands in the relationship of an image. Uh, book 4, line 4, 6, 7 and following, this is back to the first passage on side 1. What thou seest, says the voice of God, what there thou seest, fair creature, is thyself. With thee it came and goes, but follow me and I will bring thee where no shadow stays thy coming and thy soft embraces. He whose image thou art, him thou shalt enjoy, inseparably thine, to him shalt bear multitudes like thyself. Invisibly led, Eve falters once more as a result of something seen. 477 seven and following, till I espied thee, fair indeed and tall, um, under a platen, plane tree, yet methought less fair, less winning soft, less amiably mild than that smooth watery image. Eve is in the business of judging degrees of likeness, fair indeed, less fair. Once again it is a voice, that of Adam, who corrects her and instructs her how to relate to a likeness of herself. Uh, line 482 and following, whom thou fliest, of him thou art, his flesh, his bone, to give thee being I lent out of my side to thee, nearest my heart, substantial life, to have thee by my side, henceforth an individual solace dear. Part of my soul I seek thee, and thee claim my other half. And Eve's vision now sees things straight. From that time I see how beauty is excelled by manly grace, and wisdom which alone is truly fair. Closing with the fifth and final instance of the word fair in her narrative. At the level of Milton's Ovidian models, Eve reaches this point of correct relationship to Adam, her most resembling unlikeness and most unlike resemblance, as Milton describes the relation of man to woman in the Tetrachordon, and that's number 16 on the handout, um, in a very Ovidian chiasmus, it's rather like one of Ovid's own favourite lines, we're told, say me bowem que virum, say me virum que bowem. He reaches this point of correct relationship to Adam through the narrator's adroit negotiation of a path through the like and unlike Ovidian stories of Pygmalion, Narcissus and Apollo and Daphne. He will fall when she once again strays in her relationship to herself, tempted into the sin of pride uh, uh, and um, her relationship to God, uh, and Adam will follow her when he in turn is tempted to overvalue the closeness of his relationship to Eve. Adam reverts to his first acknowledgement of this inseparable likeness and attachment to Eve as he resolves to share in the fall with her. Book 9, 907 and following, uh, number 17 on the handout. Certain my resolution is to die. How can I live without thee? How forego thy sweet converse and love so dearly joined? No, no, I feel the link of nature draw me, flesh of flesh, bone of my bone thou art, and from thy state mine never shall be parted, bliss or woe. And then 952 and following. However, I with thee have fixed my lot, certain to undergo like doom. If death consort with thee, death is to me as life. So forcible within my heart I feel the bond of nature draw me to my own, my own in thee, for what thou art is mine. Our state cannot be severed, we are one. One flesh to lose thee were to lose myself. To which Eve replies, line 961, O glorious trial of exceeding love, and describes their union as one heart, one soul in both. The conjugal conceits of Ovid, uh, one soul in two bodies, with parallels in the language of Deucalion and Pyrrha and of Caix and Alsani, have been diverted to the emotional effusions of a romantic love in which the heart rules over the intellect. It will be through a painful process of self-rediscovery after the fall that Adam and Eve will establish their proper dependence as husband and wife, 
on the God in whose likeness they had been created, setting to order the hierarchy of relationships that flows from the chain of likenesses through which the world had been constituted after the fall of the rebellious angels. I, I won't give you the, the last bit on time. That's it. Right. Uh, I mean, I suppose I was, I was working to some extent with a, a model of, of uh, an Ovid who is trying to keep things separate but yes. can't really, and a Milton uh, who comes along with his sort of uh, theological uh, sort of scaffolding and, and sort of corrects um, or uh, sorts out the, the relationships of like and unlike in Ovid. But I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, to uh, think that, that Milton also ha has problems and, and that this is actually a misreading of what Milton is doing with well, Ovid. I'm not sure he has problems with it, actually. It may be that it's to his advantage to imagine that um, uh, what he sees is a world in which sort of unlikeness is a temporary phase, which ultimately the goal is likeness. Because it's, it's certainly foreseeing the future, the apocalypse, especially as associated right. with everything becoming part of a single whole. Right, but I didn't have time to talk about the Sarmacus and Hermaphroditus right. um, uh, uh, links with um, um, Raphael on, on angelic sex uh, and sort of mingling of a whole with whole, which will be a kind of reversion to the original unity of, of Adam and Eve before the creation uh, of Eve. Uh, and, I mean, uh, as, as you know, um, Salmacus and Amaphrodite is, is, is used sometimes as uh, an image of perfect marriage uh, in Renaissance literatures at the end of the 1590 uh, Fairy Queen. Um, so that would be, um, you know, in the future, uh, maybe um, uh, the apocalypse will be another time when uh, the, the hierarchy of likenesses will all sort of return to some primal kind of unity. I don't know. Yeah. Instant. 
Yes, that's uh, very nice. I, mean, I did actually engage with um, E.A. Schmidt's um, Ovid's Poetische Menschenwelt and think a bit about um, uh, so, uh, universal anthropological epic uh, and to see Milton as, as engaging with Ovid on, uh, on that uh, level uh, as well. Uh, yes. Um. Okay, well, let's thank Philip again and then we'll be on.